second speaker is Nancy Berliner from the Peabody Essex Museum, where she is the curator of Chinese art, a position she has held since 2000. She has also curated exhibits of Chinese arts at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and the Yale University Art Gallery, among others. She has lectured at Harvard University, Dartmouth College, the Asia Society of Houston, and the China Institute. Uh, Nancy has also written for the New York Times, the Asian Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, Asian Art, uh, American Craft Magazines, and so on. She's the author of In Yu Tang, The Architecture and Daily Life of a Chinese House, Beyond the Screen, Chinese Furniture of the 16th and 17th Centuries, and uh, a book that I particularly enjoy, Chinese Folk Art. Her presentation today looks at Shanghai's Jews, Art, Architecture, and Survival. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and thank everyone here in the city of San Francisco for inviting me to partake in this symposium. Um, my topic tonight, uh, today, um, is the Shanghai skyline and a consideration of the impact of the Jewish population of Shanghai on the man-made landscape of that city. Um, as you can imagine, um, the Jewish population in relation to the Shanghai population, the, the Chinese population, um, was relatively small. But in, in fact, um, we'll see that there, there was an actual um, visible impact of this small population on, on the man-made landscape. Um, one of the most important buildings on the horizon of sh Shanghai, and, and in a sense a building that became a, almost the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building in images of Shanghai for many years was the building today we call the Peace Hotel, was originally called the Cathay House or Sassoon Building, uh, was built by a Jewish man, uh, a man named Victor Sassoon. It was built on property that was uh, purchased by his family in 1877. And um, the Sassoons were Iraqi Jews. Victor Sassoon himself, even though he considered himself uh, Iraqi and Baghdadi had also lived in England for a very long time. So he had both um, Baghdadi culture in his mind, he also had British culture, but he very much identified with being a Jew and um, he was a major horse racing aficionado and he often said, uh, there's only one race greater than the Jewish race and that's the Derby. So. <laughs> A lot has been written about the Jews of China. And uh, a friend of mine who maybe some of you know, Meir Shahar, who is an Israeli sinologist, was in China one time. He was in taxi. He was speaking with the taxi driver. And the taxi driver asked him where he came from. And he said he came from Israel. And the taxi driver said, oh, you must be Jewish. And Meir said, yes, I'm, I'm Jewish. And, and the taxi driver said, well, you know, there used to be a lot of Jews in China. And, and Meir said rather cynically, well, there are more Jews who have written about the Jews in China than there actually were Jews in China. <laughs> and, and the taxi driver turned around and looked at him and said, well, I'm Jewish. So um, <laughs> there actually really were some Jews in China over the years. And I'm just going to quickly give you a um, very quick history of Jews in China. Probably the earliest evidence for Jews in China um, comes in the 8th, 9th century at Dunhuang amongst the finds, amongst all the papers and, and paintings that were found at Dunhuang in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, was a prayer written in Hebrew, a very um, popular prayer, Jewish prayer called Slichot. Uh, that was found there. So it's evidence that there were probably Jewish traders along the Silk Route coming through that area. We know that during the Song Dynasty, there was 
a group of Jews that came probably from India, probably cotton traders. There were 70 families who came and uh, settled there uh, and became, uh, over the years, grew and grew into a significant population. There are uh, papers and records that tell us that there were at least 700 people, uh, Jewish people there uh, during the 15th century and by the 17th century, there were at least a thousand Jews there. Uh, and they continue to be a very functioning Jewish society, at least through the mid-19th century. There, and as we know from this taxi driver, there are still descendants of that population floating around China. Uh, there were another group of Jews who came, as I said, from Baghdad via Bombay beginning in 1844. And that population grew over uh, the next century quite um, radically. Um, beginning in the very late 19th century, there were a lot of Jews coming from Russia. And the reason is that they were uh, being persecuted in Russia. The Russians had actually, were, were trying to expand their own trade and building railroads that went from uh, Western Russia all the way to Siberia and into China. They, they had uh, a lot of trade and were trying to build up the trade, particularly uh, in Harbin and places like that. And they encouraged Russians to move to these places, but they particularly encouraged Jews to move there and said, for instance, that if you were living in Harbin as a Jew, you would not have the same restrictions that you had living in Moscow. And so a lot of Jews moved to Harbin, to Tianjin, uh, and even uh, Ulaanbaatar. We, we know that in the 1920s, there was a big massacre of the Jews in Ulaanbaatar by Russians, and over 700 Jews were killed there. So there, there was a sizable population there. And then there were a lot of Jews that then came down to Shanghai. So we started to have a, a mixture of populations of the Baghdadi and Indian Jews, as well as the Russian Jews in Shanghai. And then, of course, um, during the 19th, late 1930s and 40s, Shanghai was a place where people who were stateless could go to. So there was a, a massive influx of about 30,000 Jews from Eastern Europe and even and Germany at that time period as a, as a way of um, escaping what was happening in Europe to the Jews at that time period. Uh, actually, just to go back for a second, um, the, the Jews that were coming from Europe really brought a new level of cultural richness to Shanghai. Uh, many of them were musicians, artists, etc. cetera. Uh, and even though after a certain time period under the Japanese, they were confined to one area. They, they had a very rich cultural life, both Jewish cultural life. Uh, there were many newspapers that were being published in Yiddish. There were radio programs, et cetera. Um, th this is a book that I saw for sale on eBay recently. Uh, it's the Jewish Talmud, and it was published in Shanghai. And uh, down below in Hebrew, it actually says Shanghai. Uh, so just to look at some of the rather uh, influential people at this time period, um, the Sassoon family was a very important family. Um, Elias David Sassoon was born in Baghdad. He moved his business to Bombay at one point. There, there was a certain point there was a, also a persecution of Jews in Baghdad. So a lot of Jews moved to Bombay. And the Sassoons had a very extensive trading company, and so they started expanding to Hong Kong. Uh, Elias David Sassoon went to Hong Kong, and then from Hong Kong he went to Shanghai because Shanghai was clearly at that point the place to be if you were a merchant. And um, many of his descendants continue to stay in Shanghai. Some went to England, and so we have this mixture of these uh, British and Baghdadi uh, Sassoon families. There was 
Jacob Sassoon, who also became very wealthy, major property owner. Um, David Elias Sassoon was originally in the opium business, uh, but he also was in property and real estate. And the family, primarily, um, as we went into the 20th century, were in the property business. Uh, another family with the Hardoons, uh, Silas Hardoon was born in Baghdad, actually to a very poor family, but he began working for the Sassoon family in Bombay and eventually went out to Shanghai, where he was continuing to work for the Sassoon family, uh, eventually decided to go out on his own, also was in the property and real estate in, in Shanghai, owned probably the majority of land in Shanghai at one point. When he died in 1921, he was considered the richest person in all of Asia. So, uh, and just a couple of other people, um, Eli Kadori, also f originally from Baghdad and Bombay, also major property owner. He. Um, he and his family originally started, you might know, the Peninsula Hotel. It's still in their family today. Uh, another man was Edward Ezra, again, also a Baghdadi Jew, well, from Baghdadi family. He actually was born in Shanghai, uh, again, became extremely wealthy property owner. He also started a newspaper that became one of the major English language Jewish newspapers in in Shanghai called Israel's Messengers, and uh, it's a wonderful font of information about the Jewish society in Shanghai from about 1901 to, I think it stopped being published in the 1930s when he passed away. Uh, these are just some clippings from the newspaper. They talked about all sorts of things. Um, many things having to do with Jews in China. It happened that, that the Baghdadi Jews were themselves fascinated by the Jews of Kaifeng and uh, actually sent people out to, to try to get the Jews to, of Kaifeng to move to Shanghai and work for the Sassoons and, and work for the other uh, Baghdadi families. Didn't work so well. The Kaifeng Jews were not so interested in that. Uh, but they were also interested in the situation of Jews all over the world. Um, and then there are wonderful advertisements that give one a sense of what some of the Jews there were doing. They had jewelry shops, textile shops, um, boarding houses, hotels, etc. cetera. Uh, I next I want to briefly talk about some of the buildings that were being built by the Jews in Shanghai and, and how they were physically uh, populating the, the urban landscape of Shanghai. And I'm going to divide this into three different groups of buildings. The first group is actually Jewish-related buildings, the, the synagogues, the clubs, etc. Then I'm going to talk about the, the homes and residences of some of these people. And then the actual public and commercial buildings that they were building that were for the um, the whole population of Shanghai, not just for Jewish residences. Um, so starting with the synagogues, there were over the years a total of probably seven different synagogues in Shanghai, and we should probably say eight because there's another one there today. Uh, the, the earliest Shanghai synagogue began in 1870. They first were renting space. In 1887, they built a synagogue. And in 1900, they built another one. And then in 1920, um, this building was built. It's called Ohel Rachel. It was supported primarily, the money was given by the Jacob Sassoon uh, in honor of his mother, uh, Rachel, or Rachel. And uh, it's a, the, it was designed by a, a non-Jewish architect, as many of these buildings were. It was designed in imitation of two synagogues in London, one which was the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in London that originally was built in 1701, 
and the other is the Lauderdale Road Synagogue that was built in 1896. So the, the architects used those two buildings as, as models for this design. Uh, as I said, the, the Russian Jews were coming from Russia, and the Russian Jews had a very different, um, well, obviously different language and some different styles of, of religious services from the Jews that were coming from Baghdad in India. Um, we often break these two groups down into the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi, the, the European Jews and the Middle Eastern or, and Spanish influenced Jews. Um, so uh, I'll call these the Ashkenazi Jews. And in reading the newspaper Israel's Messenger, which was originally put out by the Sephardic Jews, they say at one point, and, and this is quite early in 1904, I believe, 1905, they say, um, we, we've noticed that a lot of these Jews from Russia really can't follow what's going on in our services. And so uh, we've heard that they've decided to start their own synagogue. So uh, they did, in fact, in 1904, start their own synagogue. And then in 1927, they built a, a, a building that is still there today that is called Ohel Moshe. And today, if you go there, it's actually a museum to the history of the Jews and particularly the refugees that came from Europe. Uh, another building was built, again, by the Sephardic Jews. This one was mostly funded by Mr. Hardoon, also a Baghdadi Jew. Um, uh, amongst Jews, they, they always say that uh, you have to have at least two synagogues. There's a synagogue you go to and a synagogue you'd never go to. So, <laughs> uh, so amongst the Sephardi Jews, they, they broke up into two different groups because some didn't like the, the services. Some were more observant and some were less observant. So the more observant started a synagogue called the um, Beth Aharon. And in 1927, they, they built this very beautiful building. Um, I, I first learned about this building by reading a history of Shanghai that was, start, uh, that was written by a Christian minister who was living in Shanghai, and he talks about the, the, the built Shanghai and the different buildings, and in 1927, he says, the most striking building, or one of the most striking buildings was erected this year in Shanghai, and it is the Beth, uh, Beth Aharon Temple. So um, it, this building was making quite an impression, not just on the Jewish community, but also uh, the, the European and American community as well. Um, it is of Moorish design. Um, Moorish style synagogues had become popular as early as the 1820s in Europe. Um, it's a very long story about why the European Jews were, were uh, having Moorish style synagogues. It was because by the early 19th century, Jews wanted to make a mark on the landscape in Europe, they, but they also wanted to be distinctive from church design. And so the Jews in Europe were considered Arabs or Orientals, and so they decided that a Moorish design would be the most distinctive design for them to take on in Europe for their synagogue design. So Moorish designs became very uh, popular and, and really that goes all the way up to the 1950s in the United States, that style of synagogue design. So it, when the Baghdadi Jews were in building a new synagogue, they were looking to Europe for design examples and, and they, so they took this Moorish style design. Uh, it's also quite deco in design, um, and, and so I, I think that's one of the things that makes it so striking, is that it, it mixes this kind of pseudo, pseudo Moorish design with the beautiful curves that started to come out in deco architecture just about this time. Uh, in 1941, another synagogue was built, the Obviously, the 
population, the Jewish population at this point was about 40,000 Jews in Shanghai, and they were outgrowing all of their synagogues, and so this new synagogue was built. Uh, as you can see, it is very modern, very internationalist in design, deco, just a little bit beyond deco. Uh, it could seat 8,000 people at, at one sitting for a service, so it, it was enormous. Unfortunately, it was taken down in about 1993, 1995, so we don't have that many photographs of it, but this is a drawing of it but right before it went up. So in addition to uh, in addition to the, the houses of worship that were built, there were also the uh, Jewish clubs that were built. The, the Jews were not allowed into the British clubs and some of the other country clubs, so they built their own clubs. Uh, there were also Jewish schools, um, Jewish cemeteries, of course. Now I want to quickly talk about houses. Um, this is the property you can see of Hardoon's uh, estate. He, he built a very large estate and garden in, in a Chinese style garden. It was designed by a Buddhist monk uh, and it was finished in 1909 and it covered 25 acres. Now, as Renee was saying that, let's see, what did she say? One acre held 600 people, so I quickly did the mathematics. That means that this would have held 15,000 people <laughs> um, if, if, if it was Shukuman. Um, but, and it was right in the center of Shanghai. If you know where the uh, Shanghai Exhibition Center is, that's where it was. Um, okay, I'm gonna quickly run through this. I'm running out of time. Um, this is Kadori's house, Marble Hall, it had 30,000 square feet of living space in it. Um, all the walls, interior and exterior, were covered with Italian marble, and as well as all the floors. It was quite a space. Um, this is um, Ezra Edwards' home, again, a magnificent residence. Um, this is the Moeller residence. Um, built by a British Jewish family, again, still standing. It's a hotel, if you want to see there now. Um, this is the Comer home that was designed by Hudek, who was one of the great um, European international style architects in Shanghai at that point. And these are some of the homes that were lived in by the refugees, who, which obviously were not as grand. This is an interior. And just getting to the business buildings, office buildings, apartment buildings. This was the building that was built uh, very early on by Sassoon. And this is, again, Cathay House, which um, was built on the Bund, as we know. And before this building was built, the highest building on the Bund was 10 stories high. This building was 20 stories high. And so it really, in a sense, was the first skyscraper that was built in Shanghai. And in a sense, one could say that it, it really instigated and inspired the whole concept of these uh, skyscrapers that, that have blossomed now all over Shanghai. And in the 90s, 80s and 90s, when some of these first new modern skyscrapers were going up, a lot of them had these little green pyramid caps on the top, and it was in imitation of, of the Sassoon House or Peace Hotel. And the interior, as I'm sure many of you know, is just filled with beautiful deco details. Um, and this was really one of the first modern style, international style, deco style buildings that was built in, in Shanghai. Um, before that, it had been much more neoclassical architecture. And just moving along, just, well, this is 
amazing photograph I found, September 11th, 1937, but it is the Sassoon building, <coughs> which we know survived, as did many other of Victor Sassoon's buildings. Um, this was the Embankment House, um, <coughs> a large apartment building, the largest apartment building for its time period. It was, again, Streamline Art Deco. Um, it was considered not just the largest apartment building in Shanghai at the time, it was the largest apartment building in all of the Far East at the time. And to us, you know, it looks very common. We've seen many buildings built like this before, but for Asia at that time period, it was really a trend-setting trend building. You can see it here in the atlas and see how much of the bank of Suzhou Creek it took up. Um, this is another building, Hamilton House, that was also built by Victor Sassoon. Uh, and this is Broadway Mansions, which, like Cafe House, Peace Hotel, um, became really an emblem and an icon of Shanghai. This is a, a guidebook for Shanghai at that time period, and it used the uh, Broadway Mansions as its primary symbol of a building. So um, I just want to end with this slide here, which gives you a sense of the difference of the styles that Victor Sassoon was introducing at that time period into Shanghai. So thank you very much. <laughs>